Hey guys, what's up? I'm Kimmy Yam and I cover Asian American affairs for HuffPost. I am so excited to speak with our next guest, Sophia Chang. She's best known for managing some of the biggest acts from the golden era of hip hop, namely RZA, Jizza, and Old Dirty Bastard from the legendary Wu-Tang Clan. Sophia's new audiobook, The Baddest Bitch in the Room, just came out today on Audible. Uh, the memoir details her life as the daughter of Korean immigrants, navigating the music industry as a rare Asian female face in the hip hop genre. She also opens up about her marriage to a revered Shaolin monk, her kung fu practice, and of course, motherhood. Please welcome the baddest bitch in the room, Sophia Chang. Hi, Kimmy. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining me. So excited. I mean, today is your release. It's, it's the day. How are you feeling? Ready. Ready. <laughs> You're feeling good? Feel amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, for so long, you've been behind some of the biggest acts. And this whole time, there's been an Asian woman behind all these amazing golden era of hip-hop acts. But now, right now, with this book, you're in the spotlight. How is that transition for you? It's been, um, it's organic, you know? It's mm -hmm. been completely natural. It wasn't this kind of overnight thing where all of a sudden uh, everybody knew who I was and I was shot into the spotlight. I took a very conscious step into the spotlight. Mm -hmm. So I think that that probably makes that transition easier on me because it was within my control. Mm -hmm. Essentially, yes, I spent 30 years, more than 30 years helping extraordinary men tell their stories and then decided that it was time for me to tell mine. And you know, Kimmy, when I, once I crossed that line, because I was reluctant at first, once mm -hmm. I crossed that line, it was so easy. Do you feel liberated in a way? I feel liberated and my creative juices aren't even flowing, they're overflowing. There are so many things that I want to do and I discovered there are so many different ways to tell my story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I think you are a very special figure to a lot of people because there's been such a lack of Asian American representation in a lot of different areas, but mm -hmm. particularly in the hip hop industry, there are very few strong Asian female faces. And I think when we think back to the golden era of hip hop, you might have, you know, a couple Asian women in music videos or something like that huh. being exoticized yeah. sure. or fetishized. Sure. So how was it navigating that world as an Asian woman? Was it difficult to feel like a legitimate voice in the room? I think I was definitely trepidatious. I had some insecurity about it for sure, and I talk about that in my memoir. Um, but I had, I was so embraced by the community, mm -hmm. and it was a privilege to be in New York, in the hip hop community at that time, because it was so small. And so every sector of the industry would be there together, and it felt very close-knit. And I would also, you know, I say all the time, my name is Sophia Chang, and I was raised by Wu-Tang, and that means that I walk everywhere with this kind of invisible shield of armor. Mm -hmm. And knowing that I had their endorsement, so to speak, was very powerful for me. Even if I never said it overtly, people saw me with them. They saw how I moved with them and how they moved around me. And it was very, very clear. So I essentially had nine bodyguards from Staten Island. And mm -hmm. it was incredibly empowering. Yeah. I mean, you've really never been one to take any shit for as long as I've known you. Um, I'd love to hear about, you know, maybe a memorable time that you've been able to really sh shut someone down with who you are, with your, your force? Um, I mean, I think there are a number of instances where I've done that, and I kind of delight in it. But I will also <laughs> say, Kimmy, that it, it wasn't easy at first. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of what I say to everybody. Um, you just have to start. You know, whether it's, whether it's staking a claim for yourself and making your position clear, or whether it's speaking on behalf of other people, it's never that comfortable at first, but as you do it, it gets easier. So um, I can give you an example, actually, not from the memoir. This just happened the other day in Union Square. I was sitting there, I was about to go see the brilliant Hannah Gadsby, her show 
uh, Douglas. And I was sitting with my girlfriend on those stairs at Union Square. Mm -hmm. And there were these skater kids next to us, you know, six or seven of them, all boys, probably 19, whatever. And there was this one kid and literally every woman, teen, any, any age of woman that walked within earshot, he would yell something out. Hey, beautiful, nice calves, nice thighs, like the dumbest shit ever, right? Mm -hmm. And I just sat there and I'm going, yo, he is relentless. I mean, we were there for a solid 20 minutes. Okay, Kimmy? And literally everyone. Then there was a family, a family, a teenage girl with her brother and her parents, and he starts shouting out at her. Mm -hmm. Now, they're Italian, and they can't understand, and they're kind of turning and looking, but they're kind of confused, right? And so finally, at the end of it, I thought, you know what? I have to say something. Mm -hmm. So I walked up to him, when I, and, and at one point, he said to this girl, I've got, five dollars in, five, I've got $500 in my pocket. What are we doing tonight? So I walked up to him, and I stood above him, and he tried to flirt with us, too. I stood above him, I put my hands in my pockets, and I said, can I ask you something? He was like, yeah. <laughs> and I said, do you really have $500 in your pocket? He was like, yeah, what's up? And I said, you know you can buy pussy. You got $500 in your pocket? Why don't you just pay to have your dick sucked rather than yelling out and fucking sexually harassing every woman out here? Because, and I was, and my adrenaline was surging. Mm -hmm. And I walked away, and his friends were dead silent. I walked away, and I walked back, and I said, let me tell you something. If, you, if I saw you talking to my 17-year-old daughter like that, I'd slap the shit out of you. And his friends were totally quiet. And then one of his friends said, ma'am, 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 you know, I want to tell you that I love women, I respect women, and I never talk to them like that. And I was like, then check your boy, because he's fucking sexually harassing every woman that comes in this place. So that was a moment of me just gathering my steam. And I don't, I, I don't deal with everybody. But I had to deal with him because it was so egregious and it was so constant and so relentless. And I promise you that he didn't do it again for the rest of the night because none of them were protesting, not him either, mm -hmm. right? If they're all like, yeah, fuck you, bitch, whatever, none of them said that. They were all dead silent because they knew I was right. So I really hope that him and his friends will think twice before behaving like that again because he, he was, I was like, this is sexual harassment. I don't think he knew that. Mm -hmm. So that's an example, a recent example when I was tight. So how do, you, how do you get to that point where you understand that, okay, this is something that I have to, I have to speak up, I have to say something? Because you were saying that it was difficult in the beginning. It was difficult in the beginning. And look, you know, not everybody has my titanium level of confidence, and I understand that. But again, it's like I say to people, my mentees, it's all experiential. Mm -hmm. Right. So each time the first time you do it, it kind of feels uncomfortable and awkward. You know, I studied Kung Fu. Other people here might do yoga or whatever, cycling and stuff like that. The first time is really difficult. But as you do it more, it's like a muscle. It gets easier mm -hmm. with each time that you do it. And I, and I choose. look, Kimmy, I choose my battles. Mm -hmm. You know, we we can't we can't address every microaggression. You know, our quotidian lives are filled with whether it's a look, whether it's a statement, whether it's body language, we don't exhausting. address everything. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, I, I don't have time. I, I'm also not your fucking racial and sensitivity trainer. You know, I'm not here to like, each one, teach one, let me sit down. And, you know, when you say this, you, you know, you really think, I don't have time to do that, which is why I wrote a memoir, right. right? But I do think that, I think that if this boy had said maybe two or three things, I wouldn't have said anything. But after 20, I was like, it's time. Now. It's time. Now. One thing that I really loved about you is that you never shy away from the topics of love and sex. And I think that historically, as Asian women especially have been fetishized um, in a way that a lot of times our sexuality is taken away from us and that we don't have agency over that. So when you're speaking out about things like love and sex, do you feel like you are reclaiming these topics for yourself, or do you ever feel like you're kind of perpetuating like the fetishization of Asian women? Uh, well, I mean, okay, so if we want to talk about what I call the eroticization, exoticization, you know, we're eroticized, yes. we're exoticized, and we're fetishized, mm -hmm. right? Well, let's talk about who has the agency in that scenario. Mm -hmm. Sure as fuck isn't us, right? right? All of that is truly, truly through the white male lens. Mm -hmm. Right. So and, and I'm not saying that you can't fulfill those stereotypes. That's fine. But do it on your own terms. Right. Right. So when I think about us, Kimmy, when I think about Asian women and the sexual stereotypes that exist for us, 
Mm -hmm. There is the geisha, right? The submissive geisha, and she's in her silk kimono, and she always has her head bowed, and she serves you her tea, and she'll do anything you ask her to. And then all of a sudden, over here, then you have the dominatrix. You have the dragon lady, and she's got a big fucking dragon tattoo running down her back, and she's got a whip and all that. And listen, those two kinds of women can exist, and all good. But where's the middle class, so to speak? Where are the women that, that, that exist between those two extremes? Mm -hmm. And so my thing is, in, in speaking so openly about my sexuality, about my dating life, particularly as a middle-aged woman, mm -hmm. is more about saying, I'm not gonna let the dominant culture define me. And this is me outside of sexuality, this is me everywhere, politically, socially, in all of those ways. I refuse to let the dominant culture tell me whether or not I'm beautiful or powerful or smart or sexy. Mm -hmm. I know that shit. So let me tell you. I'm not gonna let you tell me. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like as a middle-aged woman um, speaking out about these issues that you're able to kind of break through some of the taboos that people deal with? I hope so. I mean, I think so. Um, you know, if you, if, you, if you look on my Instagram, which is probably where I'm the most vocal other than up until today, where I have seven and a half hours that you can listen to, um, the vast majority of my followers and those who are the most engaged are women of color. A number of them who are middle-aged, who are my peers, right? And what they pull me over and say to me is something like, you know, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being fearless. Thank you for, you know, just being so outspoken about who you are because it gives us permission to do the same. Mm -hmm. So I do think that I'm able to break through and certainly with this memoir and everything else that I plan to do in the future, yeah, I'll continue. You, look, I, I live to fuck up a stereotype. Yeah. I live to completely, you know, the French would say bouleverser, I live to completely turn uh, a stereotype upside down and smash anybody's preconceived notions of who or what I am. Mm -hmm. I want to get a little bit more into your memoir and your personal life. So mm -hmm. you definitely go into your marriage to your ex, a mm -hmm. revered Shaolin monk. Mm -hmm. And I know that going through that entire journey, there were a lot of beautiful, beautiful moments. Yeah. And there's also a lot of pain. Yeah. So in writing this book, I wonder what that... What, what was that like, kind of rehashing those moments? Did you feel like there was kind of a cleansing or you know, a rebirth after like thinking about these very, 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 you know, monumental life events that happened with this man. You know, people have asked me if the writing of this memoir was a cathartic experience. And I wouldn't say that it was cathartic because I think catharsis implies that there was somehow a great trauma that needs to be worked through. Mm -hmm. And nothing with Yan Ming was necessarily traumatic. Was it disappointing and heartbreaking? Absolutely. Um, I think, Kimmy, that what was really really critical to me mm -hmm. was that I was truthful to everything. And that meant too, falling in love with that man. Mm -hmm. I fell deeply in love. I mean, he, he remains to this day the most singular human being I've ever met. I don't think I will ever meet anybody like him. And it was really important for me to speak that truth. Mm -hmm. But revisiting, you know, the 29 year old me who like steps, trips upon this, you know, that was, 25 years ago, that trips upon this Shaolin monk, and I'm like, oh my God, and I've got stars in my eyes. Yeah, I had to go back to that. I read my journals and everything, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be truthful to what that experience was. And I hope you got a sense in listening to it, mm -hmm. how deeply in love I was with him, and yes. how important he was to me. And then on the other side of that, the disappointment, you know, I tell that story about um, confronting that woman that I thought was probably fucking my ex. In the end, I don't think um, he was. Um, and I say in the memoir, you know how they tell you, be careful that you don't say something that you're gonna regret. I never regretted saying it to this day. There's no part of me that's like, oh, you, you shouldn't have said this. You, no, I should have said every fucking word that I said to that bitch that night. As truthful as you could have been. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, going into family and mm -hmm. all of these, these journeys that you've had along the way, you can't forget how important your parents have been throughout this whole thing. And I know that especially culturally, I think that our parents crave stability for us. Yeah. And that's why, you know, we are kind of ushered into these professions of, you know, the medical field or, right. or legal profession, but right. we're, cr we're in the creative world. Um, so I would love to know how you felt like your, your parents took that. Well, I think that it is a really common experience for first-gen Asians like us, mm -hmm. right? That's exactly right. So our, our parents leave 
everything behind. They make this tremendous sacrifice, right, Kimmy? Right. They leave behind their family, their culture, their cuisine, their language, their faith, their community, everything that makes them comfortable. And then they come to this country where they have to fumble, you know, stumble in the language and get to know everybody and the practices and everything. And, you know, they make that sacrifice, namely for us, mm -hmm. even if we're not born yet. So the expectation that we will do something that they see as stable is understandable. Right. You know, I, you know, my mother didn't escape from North Korea at 14, and then her, she and my father, God rest his soul, emigrate over here so that I could be like, I want to be a sculptor. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I mean, speak to yeah. any any speak to any first gen immigrant and they will tell you that the, the there is a very narrowly prescribed path. Mm -hmm. Lawyer, doctor, scholar, you know, med right. engineer, whatever it is. My parents were actually unique. I would say that they were anomalous. Mm -hmm. My parents were they I think part of it, too, was that they knew me so well. I was like, I'm going to move to New York. I didn't even go to my university graduation, which is kind of stunning to me. And I only realized that, how, how ungracious that, that must have seemed when I was younger. Um, and they never said, Sophia, when are you gonna get married? When are you gonna give us grandchildren? Mm. When are you gonna have a real job? I mean, I will tell you this in all sincerity. I have been in New York City for 32 years. I think this is the first time in my life that my mother can tell her friends what I do. She wrote a book. Mm. Otherwise, she has no context for what I've done up until now. Right. And yet and still, my parents, were incredibly supportive and that they didn't try to push me into something else. Yeah, for sure. I think that is a very unique experience, yes. but yeah, I also great. appreciate how you understand kind of the other side, why there is this like craving of for course. stability. I, I mean, as a parent, Kimmy, I totally get it. Listen, yeah. if either of my children, I have a 17 year old daughter and a 19 year old son, if either of my children came to me and said they wanted to be a rapper, I would lock them in the rooms. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! The tr a true Asian mom. I, I, totally. I stand. I'd be a like, okay, Asian go mom. clean, go clean the kitchen now. <laughs> um, so I'd love to know. So there is somewhat of a double-edged sword to being one of the first, right? Mm -hmm. To being one of the first in hip hop, um, because it it shows that you've had enough resilience and have enough talent to really make it. But it also exemplifies just how little space there is for Asians in this industry. So I would love to know how you feel the most effective way is to really lift other people up and create more space for Asians like you and me. I mean, you know, I say in my memoir, as a petite Asian woman, I never had the luxury to simply lean in. Mm -hmm. Right. I had to kick down the motherfucking door. I had to learn to be big and strong in other ways. Mm -hmm. And what I will say, and I've kicked down many doors, Kimmy. Mm -hmm. And what I will say is that when that door, when after I kicked down that door, I didn't let that bitch close behind me. I kept it open and I brought my people through. And I learned this from my mentor, Michael Austin, because I am certain that every room that Michael Austin walks into and every meeting that he's in, in the back of his mind, he's thinking, how can I, how can I bring Sophia Chang into this? And I'm like that too. Mm -hmm. Even through the process of recording my memoir and getting it out and all the interviews I'm doing, I'm thinking about how can I get my friends in here too, mm -hmm. right? If I do an interview, I did a podcast the other day and I told them about my incredible, ingenious friend, Reedy Tariel, and I said, you should really get her on here. She's got this biotech company, have her in here. So I think I am so dismayed when I see people of color because there are not so many of us. Right. When they seem to get to that space and then don't try to bring other people with them. This is, right. this is what we should be doing, right? For those of us on the margins, and there are so many of us, mm -hmm. we live on the margins. It's our job to pull them into the center because the center is where the power resides. Mm -hmm. The center are the conference rooms. The center are the golf games. The center are the conversations had behind closed doors and, where the and again, where those powerful decisions are made. So if we ever make it into those places, mm -hmm. we have to consider it of paramount importance to bring other people from the margins into there with us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you do that, Kimmy. I try my best. You do. I try my best. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Sophia, so all of us know your line, right? I am Sophia Chang, and I was raised by Wu-Tang. Yeah. I would love for you to share what the most important lesson you've learned from the Wu is. Huh. Wow, to distill it down to one lesson, Kimmy, that's a, that's a behemoth task. It truly um, is. I think 
the greatest thing that I learned from them was that I deserved everything that I have. And I think that that's become even more clear in writing this memoir and in recording it and talking to them about it. And then basically saying, yeah, so if this is what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Like Ray Kwan said, so if you've always been an artist, and I never thought about yeah. it that way. And so, you know, old dirty bastard, God rest his soul. He was the first person to say, I want you to manage me. Mm -hmm. Method Man was the first person ever to say, you're family, Soph. Riz was the first person to empower me as a general manager. All of those things were like a battery in my back that said, you might not understand it, Soph, and you might not believe it, but here you go. And get out there and do it. Mm -hmm. That is beautiful and a beautiful there, lesson. Um, I think we're going to go to some audience questions. We have awesome. two right now. Hi. Thank you for coming to talk to us today. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, you exude all this confidence and you have all this strength and power to, like, speak out for yourself and what you believe in, but you also speak out for others. When um, were you able to start speaking out for other people? Because that takes another level of courage. It does, but this is the first thing I'm going to say. Stand up again. Okay. Introduce yourself, first and last name. Hi, I'm Rhea Thopper. It's lovely nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Always, my advice to you, always introduce your same first name and last name. Okay, so your question is, when did I, uh, when did I gather the courage to speak up for myself and then on behalf of others? I mean, I think to some degree, certainly since I was a child, I've always been outspoken and I've always kind of stuck up for myself. I have a story in my memoir about being a kid um, and walking in the park and this kind of burly the bully, the white boy bully saying to me, where are you from? Which is, you know, if you're a person of color, that you understand what that question means. So in, in terms of advocating for myself in that way, I've always kind of done that. I think in terms of doing it for other people, um, it certainly came when I was an adult. I wish it had come sooner. And again, if you see, you know, it's like, it's, we see it all the time in the New York City subways. If you see something, say something. Because mm -hmm. this is my hope, right? Is that, Okay, so I'm, I'm often the only woman in the room. More often the only woman of color in the room. And there are things that are said that are offhanded, and you might kind of go, I think that's racist, or I think that's sexist. And again, you don't address every little thing, and it depends on the timing, but, this is, but, but if I stand up and say something, my intentions are threefold. I want the results to be threefold. Number one, I want to make my point. Number two, I want you to know this is who the fuck Sophia Chang is. I will check you if you're going to be fucked up about it. But number three, I want you to do this when I'm not here. I don't want, I don't, again, I don't want to be the person that's always like, no, you should, no, you should. Motherfucker, you have seen me do this enough times. Let me just sit back one. You know what's going through my mind. You stand up and say it. That's what I'm hoping to encourage everybody to do after they've witnessed me do it. So if you've ever thought about saying something or walking out of here, in any scenario, if you think about saying something, just do it. And, and you might fuck up and you might fumble. I've done it. I've, I've messed up plenty, plenty of times. I've overstepped plenty of times. But in general, the net of it is it's had a good effect. And I think that's such an important Thanks. thing to recognize is that you can fall too during All this whole time. process. I've fucked up so many times. <laughs> I'll probably fuck up later day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got one more question from the audience. Hi, um, my name is Poppy Shen, and um, hearing you sharing your about your story, who you are, what you do is super inspiring. Um, I'm 22 and I actually just started my first full-time job two weeks ago. So I was wondering like, what kind of advice would you have for like, young girls like me or us who just started their career in, like, in like, a big city like New York? Well, congratulations, Thank Poppy. You. Thanks for the question. Um, what I would advise you to do is learn as much as you can about what's going on around you not just what falls within your purview. You know, this is one of the things that I did. I am, in, I am intensely curious about everything. And so the more that I can take in, the more that I can learn. I was an assistant and I read every single memo that came across my desk because I wanted to become educated because I'm assuming that you want to ascend, right? And one of the things that you can do um, that's at your disposal is educate yourself about your job you know, your department and then the company at large. And then when the opportunities arise, if you have an idea, say what your idea is, you know? And again, learn how to advocate for yourself and find out what your peers are making. 
Find out what the white man sitting next to you who has the same title as you and who's been there as long as you is making because I promise you it's probably more than what you're making. And I would say that one of the greatest skills that I developed, and this is thanks to the RZA, is negotiation. I think that m many of us as women, we're not taught how to negotiate. We're, we're not told how to talk about money. And more profoundly and more nefariously, we're not really told how to value ourselves. So understand what your value is. And I was exactly you, okay? I moved here in 1987, I was 22 years old, and I was, I don't know this about you, but I know that me, I was a hyper-efficient Asian woman. <laughs> you put something on Sophia's desk, that shit is getting taken care of. And that was really good, but then it got to the point where I was considered, well, that's just, that's what she does. And that is what I did, but I also balanced it with asserting myself. Mm -hmm. Right, because you don't want to just be the repository for the tedium that get, that you know the quotidian tedium that needs to get done. You want to be considered that, but you also want to show everybody the 360 degree version of you. Does that help? Thank you so much. You're welcome. It really even helped me. Okay. <laughs> um, Sophia, thank you so much for thank sitting you, down you. with me. The baddest bitch in the room is out today on Audible. Download, download, download. <laughs> Thank you.